And I used examples like that, as hurtful as they may be to his family, but I used examples to the cadets to say, look, I'm telling you that you won't know all the answers and we don't know what's coming around the corner. But if you're not an officer of moral character, you will never be able to na navigate all of these you know, difficult, confusing situations. And so we started down that road, making officers and leaders of moral character. <laughs> We have a fantastic program today. We're going to be continuing our special Veterans Day event. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate that you support us in being able to do things like this. We appreciate you liking and subscribing because that helps us fight off the dark cyber overlords at YouTube that have, you know, they're mad at me right now. They've suspended me again. So that certainly helps if we get some likes and subscriptions. But we do have a very special guest who is a veteran himself. It's a friend of mine who actually goes to church with me, Scott Lockwood, a colonel in the United States Air Force. And so we bring him on right now. Welcome to the program, Scott. Thank you for being here. Oh, you bet. Thanks a lot, Caleb. I appreciate you asking me. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a slam dunk. In fact, uh, he was actually speaking at Faulkner's Chapel this morning, and I realized that I didn't, you know, I, I had dropped the ball and not gotten a guest for Veterans Day. And I was like, I don't know why I didn't ask Scott like a week ago, Like, <laughs> but he was very generous with his time, willing to come on at short notice. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. You bet. That's a good sign that, uh, of course, that I have no real job and that <laughs> nothing's happening in my life. So I was at your beck and call. <laughs> well, uh, however you wound up here, we're appreciative of it. I think okay. the Lord helps us out with that. Uh, but, you know, I know a little bit about your personal history, but I'm sure that I'm going to learn something here, too. So uh, just before we start and, and really get into the meat and potatoes, what we want to talk about here on Veterans Day, if you would give the audience just kind of a background and a, a summary of your military career. OK, yeah, I started in uh, 87, actually went into the uh, officer training program, uh, flight screening program to be a pilot in the United States Air Force. And uh, I remember they, you know, they threw a big party for me at Chandler, Arizona. You know, he's, he's joining the Air Force. He's going to go see the world. And uh, my first tri pilot training base was in Chandler, Arizona. So mm. I was back in town after about uh, four months and people would see me on the streets, you know, and say, oh, you know, gee, Scott, that's, that's too bad they didn't work out. You know, I'd be like, no, no, I'm out at the base flying uh, jets. And they're like, oh, that's okay. You know, it's all right. But uh, it did work out. It was a lot of fun to be back uh, in my hometown actually training. And that was a year at uh, Williams Air Force Base outside of Chandler. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then after that, I was a T-37 instructor out there. My wife and I lived out on base for a while. And uh, then they shut the gates of that place down um, hmm. under one of the BRAC actions. And then I uh, went over to Enid, Oklahoma, finished up there and then flew A-10s. I was at Pope Air Force Base back when it was an Air Force Base and uh, worked along with uh, Fort Bragg at Fayetteville. Uh, that was pretty good, pretty good duty there. We had deployed quite a few times, so I think my first year there, at Pope, I was probably deployed about 270 days out of that first year and about 220 after that. Um, so it was it, it was rough in a lot of ways. I, all I wanted to do is fly jets, but uh, there was a high price to pay. What had happened was really mm. uh, is uh, under the Clinton administration, they had drawn down you know, the foreign bases so much in Europe, uh, but that increased our overseas commitment by about 400 percent. So it was a little bit rough. And Finally, in about June of 98, I got out uh, thinking about uh, children and being a father, and I didn't want to be an absentee father, so I got out and joined the Guard, and I flew for the Air National Guard out of Battle Creek, Michigan, and then uh, got on with an airline and started flying with them. Uh, but then uh, after 9-11, uh, the airline started uh, taking a, a big crash and burn and then went back into the Air Force as an active Guard and Reserve AGR system. And then uh, had really great duty. I was very blessed. I didn't have to deploy. I was at headquarter jobs, uh, worked at uh, Peterson at uh, Northcom, which is the uh, civil defense and civil support of uh, authorities there and natural disaster relief, that kind of thing. And then went to Stratcom. I worked there, worked in Washington, D.C., uh, chief of rated management for their National Guard. Uh, so I did a lot of interesting things. Got to go to Army War College at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was a wonderful year. Um, just a, a really great experience uh, mm -hmm. to do that and got a master's there. Uh, then I came back and then was the commandant of officer training school at Maxwell Air Force Base for three years. That was from 2013 to uh, the summer of 2016. And then I retired in 2016 and went back to the airlines. So that's really kind of it in a nutshell. It's 28 years total duty, 23 years active duty. You know, that's incredible. And one thing that I do love about talking to military people is when I ask them about their career and their story, it's never boring. 
That's the one thing. That's like right. it's, it's always lots of moving, lots of uh, yeah. going on different assignments. So I think it was 14 different addresses is what uh, Kelly and I, we, we counted it up one time. So those were 14 different addresses. And that was, uh, yeah, that was a lot of moving. Yeah, I was talking to uh, your wife this morning right after you spoke, and uh, she was actually talking about that with uh, President Williams, of course, at Faulkner, who's talking about moving. And she was saying, yeah, that's the way it was with me and Scott. We, I just get home one day and he'd be like, well, we're moving to this place you've never heard of. And <laughs> like, That's right. You would think we'd have been smart and kept our household goods very small. But I remember by the time uh, towards the last, uh, the end moves there. I think we were filling up an entire semi-tractor trailer full uh, <laughs> with our goods. And I've got three daughters and all of their stuff. And so we were, yeah, we were definitely costing the military at that point. Yeah, I've, I'm sure you, that you were, but uh, uh, it's, you, you know, it's just something that comes with the territory is that you do a lot of moving. And we're very grateful that because we have Maxwell here that it, somehow brought you here to us and uh you've been a, a great addition to our church and somebody that uh really look up to so i appreciate you know the fact that the military brought you here well thank you caleb i appreciate that so i wanted to talk to you about that is somebody like you that has a, a very long military career i mean you're you're a career military guy um what kind of changes did you see over the years i mean like what was different from the time you started in the air force and, and by the time that you got out what were the biggest changes you noticed well that was that's a great question um <clears throat> you know the, the 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 united states air force for a long time prided itself in training like you fight and uh somewhere along the way we we kind of started losing our way i believe because what happened was uh, we ended up in a situation where sensitivities of uh, you know, kind of the social construct started rearing its head. And uh, and so then we had to become more and more sensitive to everybody else's sensitivities. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, when, back when I when I first got in, you know, they, they would yell at you and you would go through and then you would have to clean your room. And then whether it was clean or not, you know, somebody was going to find something. Then you'd be doing burpees, push-ups and, you know, running at five in the morning or whatever. Well, mm -hmm. all of that became abuse after the Lackland uh, sexual abuse scandal. Uh they they kind of exploded that thing into some uh you know monster that just enveloped a lot more than just sexual harassment sexual abuse and assault uh then it got to be everything you know everything was maltraining and so by the time i ended and in fact i ended where i started i started at officer training school um mm -hmm. but that was when it was back in uh, at uh, lackland or a medina complex in san antonio and then mm -hmm. i ended up being a commandant in the end of my career and it was a completely different place because, uh, for instance, I'd, I'll just give you a great example. We had an individual, uh, it was a 17-year 17 17 year airman, just a wonderful record. He's one of my best instructors. He's in military training instructor, so he wore the Smokey Bear hat, and he was a drill instructor, uh, better known as a drill instructor. Right. And uh, after doing calisthenics in the morning, he said, all right, go ahead, hit the dorm, take a shower, come out fall into place, uh, get in formation, and, and we'll go off to breakfast. Well, they came out pretty quick, and he asked me, he said, did you shower? And apparently the whole squadron said, well, yeah, we had, and, and he knew they hadn't. And so he said, okay. He said, listen, uh, you've lied to me, and that was an honor violation, and he could have just proceeded to start kicking them out and doing the paperwork. It would have been ugly, but it's, you know, what they that's what they signed, that they weren't going to lie, cheat, or steal. And so... He said, I'll tell you what, he says, uh, I'll, uh, I'll save you, though. He goes, you'll just answer to me. So he took him out and he started running. And then when they said, you know, hey, we got blisters, he's like, okay, fall out, step over here. Everybody take a breath, take a water. They started drinking water, rested up. All right, hit the track again. They started running. Uh, then they came back in. Somebody's knee was hurting. Okay, step aside. I don't want you to hurt your knee. Get some water. Everybody rest up. All right, start running again. Well, anyway, that went on through breakfast. So they missed breakfast. Uh -huh. Well, because they missed breakfast. That was called maltraining. That individual received an Article 15 from my boss, a general officer, and uh, it ruined his career. And he had to leave the Air Force um, uh, under less than uh, you know stellar conditions. And what a crying shame that uh, we ended up in a situation because I used to I used to look at these cadets and think, what movie on the military haven't you seen? You do understand what we're about. Like they would show up and they could do three push-ups. And then we would try to send them home and they would start crying. And we would say, well, you know, uh, we, you have to do at least 20 or whatever their category was. Uh, but they, they said, well, our recruiter said we can get in shape while we're here. And I'm like, no, no, we don't have time for that. You need to hit the ground running. And uh, it was just a totally different game. And so uh, that, along with the sensitivities of everything else, 
um, with the men and women, uh, you know, being mixed and everything was just a is different. There's some good changes that happened. Uh, you could not uh, have a lot of the sexual harassment, the sexual innuendos going on. We don't need those. We don't need to disrespect people. Uh, I have three daughters. How dare anybody think that they're going to make them feel uncomfortable by doing that? Uh, but also, we cast the net a lot wider than that. And so it got to a point where we could hardly really do anything without people complaining. And I remember an MTI getting in trouble because he, he said something like, well, what's the matter with you to the, one of the recruits? And they mm -hmm. said, well, that made me feel dumb. So, you know, we had to, we had to nip all that in the bud. And so now uh, here we are, you know, worried about uh, the, the gender of individuals and all of that and how they, you know, commanders are having to offer whether they, you know, can have a sex change or whatever. Uh, while well, the Russians and the Chinese are, are out there and they're still firing weapons and crawling through the mud. So uh, uh, that's that's a lot of the changes that I saw. And that's the biggest ones that I think stand out in my mind was that mm. uh, after a while, you just kind of wondered what, you know, where is this thing going to end up? And it wasn't going to be good. So, yeah, I, I do see a pretty st a stark contrast in the Chinese military who just released a video or recruitment video of them breaking uh concrete blocks with sledgehammers over their abs and our newest PSA video where it's a military person talking about her lesbian moms. I mean, they, there's a pretty stark contrast yeah. there. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Right. And if you know, it, it, the, the thing that's really going to hurt us very quickly and that's already hurt us. And I think you could see that even in Afghanistan uh, withdrawal, but that is that uh, when you start uh, discriminating on the basis of race and gender to be able to put people in, certain positions, uh, then you can really lose sight of who is uh, best for the job. And, and, and we have got a, a horde of great, great individuals that are retiring right now mm -hmm. that probably, if you looked at their track record from the very beginning, from, a, from about the time you're a captain, they start selecting you and pulling you out. And then you realize you're on a track to go to senior leadership. It's very early on. And these individuals that hit all the bases, done all the right things, uh, but they came up on 06, 07, 08 boards, and uh, then they started falling out, and others were promoted in front of them because of who they were, and uh, and that is going to really, really hurt uh, the effort in the long run. And all we were worried about, obviously, is how it looked. Well, we want this, you know, this regime to look this way. We want the demographics to reflect this, and uh, rather than saying, okay, who do you need to to lead troops and make these decisions? And so that's really going to be something that comes back to haunt us, I believe. Well, you know, Scott, I'm a big believer in transparency and being able to see what's going on. I mean, one of the reasons that our military, kind of like you were pointing out in your talk today, is seen as a liberating force, not an oppressive force, at least in the minds of, of most Americans. Uh, the reason that, that we do, you know, have a special place in our heart for the military and the reason we have a day to celebrate them is because we have always sort of seen them as that... Um, you know, that, that liberating force that is, is someone that defends our liberty as opposed to one that takes advantage of it. And I think one thing that we, uh, one of the parts of that, or I guess the rationale behind that is because we, we believe in their mission. And so I say all that to, to bring this up. I do understand that there is a level of accountability that we want in the military to the citizenry. But I also think we can't have every single member of the military constantly worried about how every little thing looks to the public. And I think that that's actually been something that's been devastating to um, the military. I say that as an outsider, of course, though. No, and I think I agree with you there. And I think that I, I understand that there are, uh, you know, that, that when, when, when we are too worried about what's happening uh, and we have congressmen that, uh, and women that are just unwilling to stand up and do the right thing. And uh, they're cowing to their constituency, as radical as they may be, um, when they, when they, you know, they're not too interested in the facts. I, I know that personally, mm -hmm. uh, I answered so many congressionals and so many complaints that people, you know, well, this was my dream and I was treated unfairly. And, and you know, you would think somewhere that they could have, somebody could have stopped it, but they had to send that down and it got rubber stamped at a, you know, second Air Force level. And then they got sent back down and, uh, the, you know, went through the uh, Air University and then it came to officer training school. And then we were running around trying to answer why we were kicking out some kid that had lied, cheated and steal and, and couldn't couldn't run a mile, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we were always answering because, uh, you know, 
the politicians being who they were, they were so easy to uh, to cow to everybody rather than just go, hey, look, I think they've got this. And uh, and yeah, that's been, I think that is a problem. And just like you said, you know, you start answering to too many that don't understand the inside, uh, then that could be detrimental as well. It's a good point. Well, I tell you this, and I, when I ask this question, Scott, I want you to say to me, this is what I want you to say. Caleb, you're crazy. That's all in your imagination. <laughs> Uh, it's not really like that. I genuinely am concerned that what you're talking, the wave of people retiring and, and being taken out, it's not just uh, about race and demographics. Based on what happened uh, with, uh, you know, the, the what was it like a, across the board, all branches of the military, the stand down order after January 6th and looking into people's background and trying to figure out, is this person a Trump supporter? Because if they right. are, I mean, like the, the skepticism that came after that, um, I, I've never seen anything like that. I think that they may they might actually be trying to purge the military and make them ideologically in one uh, like they're they're trying to get rid of all the people that might not think the way that the people in charge do now, and that scares me. And is is that a valid concern? Because again, I want you to say no, Caleb. They're not doing that. You're you're overblowing it. But, but honestly, what is your take on that? Yeah, Caleb, you're crazy, and you're no. You, you know, you're, you're crazy anyway, but well, that's uh, true. But the, un the unfortunate part, Caleb, is that's absolutely what's happening. And uh, if you look at history, if anyone is not afraid of taking the military and purging out a conservative political view or somebody that disagrees with the wokeness that's happening, if that doesn't frighten you, because remember, a coup will never happen. And you can never have an overthrow and you can never turn around and oppress your own people without what? The, without the you have help to have of the, the military. military. You, have right. to have the military. you have to have the military. Well, what they're doing is they're purging out individuals now that stand for freedom and liberty. And that's the discussion that's off the table in politics now. It's about uh, wokeness and social engineering. It's all about uh, some kind of justice that's, you know, a justice that the left gets to define like, uh, you know, environmental justice, whatever that is. But uh, if it's if that's what's happening and you end up with a, a force that's going to do the bidding of a radical leftist, well, then what difference is it going to be whether it's a Che Guevara in charge or anybody else? Because that's that's what you're going to end up with. And I think that's what they're aiming for. Uh, that's what's happened, obviously, with the FBI. They're making mm -hmm. raids on, you know, conservative reporters houses and things that they wouldn't have done at all, you know, some years back. And you're thinking, wow. Uh, you know, we always ask ourselves, how can a postmodernist industrialized nation like Germany end up in the situation that they were in mm -hmm. and doing that kind of thing with the Gestapo? And uh, and I think you're watching it happen. I think you're watching, uh, the you know, the freedom, uh, you know, kind of the last gasping breath of it uh, in America as we're so concerned with supposedly other things and, uh, you know, the weaponized racism and, the you know, all the... Uh, ethnic discussions that are going on, xenophobia, and everybody's a phobic about this, that, or the other that the left stands for. And mm -hmm. if you're against them, you know, you've got some kind of deranged thing. So, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think the fear is real. And, um, and you I know think what's, that's what's happening. What's really sad about that is the military was, you know, I'm not saying that there were never problems with that in the past, because obviously there were, they're well documented through history. But one of the great things that I loved about the military, despite having never served myself, is it's it's a uniting thing. I mean, you talk about the everybody being concerned about the racism and xenophobia. When you put on that that uniform, that goes away, and that's the way it should be. Like you don't care whether they're black or uh, Hispanic or whatever Arab. If they're wearing the uniform and they're willing to lay down their life for their country, I mean, that, that's your brother in arms. And so I always kind of thought the military was was great at kind of erasing those lines. Yeah, that is true. And so it has to you have to bring it back up and you have to kind of wire brush people and make it a sensitive uh, issue again. And that, of mm -hmm. course, that's happened all across the board, even in the in the civilian population. Right. We, 20 years ago, we weren't talking about all this. And now suddenly, you know, every every child that's growing up, that's, you know, 16 years old, suddenly their 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 big moral issue of the day is racism. And that used not to be so. But the military is a perfect example, like you said, where you're lockstep with those, you know, brothers in arms and and in the end, people would tell you in the military is that when you're going into battle or you're doing something, it's, you know, you may have signed up for country, you may have signed up for freedom, you may have signed up all, but when the bullets start flying, you're right there at the edge. It's, it's all about just coming together for each other. 
It's about the guy on your right. It's about the guy on your left and uh, the gal behind you. And you're, you're, you're coming together. And, and, and what a shame to start mm -hmm. splintering all of that and, and being so divisive and, uh, you know, putting suspicion on everybody and, you know, for them to come up with uh, such ideas like when the military said, well, Black Lives Matter is an apolitical organization, but, uh, but you can't fly a, a flag with a thin blue line on it or whatever, because, you know, that's, that's a controversial thing. And so uh, just the very fact that they have such a radical political view is, is really detrimental to the, you know, uh, homogenous nature of the military, what it otherwise would be. Uh, so they, they, you know, they've, they've tried to do everything, right? They've tried to right. they've tried to put pic people's picture in there, and then they took the pictures away. Then they tried to mask their identity and their gender and their race, and then that didn't work, and then they, they didn't have the right people promoted. So now they want to put points, different points on different systems, and it's just they're so concerned with all this uh, rather than just you know getting on with the business at hand, which is right. I remember I remember years ago, Caleb. This mm -hmm. has been a long time ago, but mm -hmm. years ago. At Squadron Officer School, it's now Squadron Officer College, but at Squadron Officer School, we had an individual walked in, stepped up there in, in Montgomery, Alabama, stepped up on the stage, and he goes, you know what? He goes, uh, I don't care about segregation or desegregation. He goes, you know why we desegregated? Because we fight better that way, because morale is better, and we fight better as a nation that way. He says, otherwise, I could care less whether we desegregate, segregate, whatever. He says, in other words, he goes, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but he says, I'm telling you, the military is out there to kill people and break things. It's out there mm -hmm. to do violence. And he says, you know, that should be what everything is thought of is like, how efficient can you do to be in, uh, you know, be in that, uh, that blocking force or that guarding force, the attacking force. And now we're so just all concerned about everything else, but, uh, and how is it not going to suffer? How is the tip of the spear not going to suffer when we're so worried about what the, you know, every little piece of wood that the shaft is made up of? And so uh, I think your fear is just, just really relevant. And that, and that is sad to say. Well, and, and I don't remember, granted, like I said, being somebody that's looking at on the outside looking in, uh, I don't remember a whole lot of war movies where guys are like down in the trenches and like before they go out and, and have the guy behind them covering like, by the way, what do you think the top tax bracket should be? Like, that's not, <laughs> not, not really a concern right, right then. Right. Not saying they don't talk about it in their off time, but you're yeah. right. I mean, that and that's the thing. It, it does bring people together of different, yeah. I, you know, I have a buddy that was um, uh, army and uh, was the best man at his gay brother's wedding. I disagree with him on virtually everything. <laughs> But, you know, if he was a good soldier, so what? I don't care that his politics are different. Um, but, you know, I, I did want to just kind of circle back to uh, borrow Jen Psaki's line. Um, I, I did want to uh, just circle back to something that you said with uh, Afghanistan, which you kind of briefly touched on. Um, what what could we have, because I, I mean, the, the last stand on that was really an airfield, and so your Air Force. So what, what could we have done to fix that? Like, is... Because the way that we hear it talked about is, well, that's how it goes. There wasn't really anything else we could do. If we were going to pull out of Afghanistan eventually, then it, w it had to be that way. Um, first of all, is that correct? And if not, what could we have done to make it you know, not as, as much of a disaster as it was? Well, the first thing we should have done is kept politics out of it. We should have kept the president from uh, running around saying, well, this is the date we're going to be out because the Taliban told us to be out on that date. We should have got out on our own good time, which meant we'll get out when we're good and ready, when things are set up, when we've gotten all the non-combatants out and everybody that's vulnerable and on our, all of our vulnerabilities are covered. And why would it have to be one last airfield that you're holding as you're running out while everybody's surrounding the fence there and busting down the gates? Mm -hmm. It's uh, there are there are a lot of ways to extricate yourself, uh, you know, from a battle. It probably wouldn't have been good and easy, but you know, it's uh, it's different than if if uh, you know if I want to step out of the ring, you know, in the octagon. Uh, if I give you a good licking first, and you're over there in the corner licking your wounds, and then I climb out, that's different than you beating up on me as I'm trying to get out of the octagon. And that's the easiest way I can say it. I mean, mm. we had them on the ropes in so many ways, different ways and uh, shapes and forms. So if you keep them in a situation where uh, we still have the upper hand and we still had the aggressive force there, uh, then we call the shots and then we're able to do 
uh, the things on the timing and the place of our choosing, which is really what war is all about. Right. We, you get to leave on your own terms. You get to leave on your own terms. You get to tack on your own terms. You get to stay if you want it on your own terms or whatever. But everything is at a place and a time of our choosing. And that is strategy of war. We gave up all of that when we started announcing dates and places and we we're, you know, I mean, it looks like. Right. We, it wasn't the premiere of a movie. <laughs> right. I mean, this looked like. You know, the the Roman hordes or something coming against, you know, some some poor, you know, battle out there where you see nothing but shields and spears and, and swords laying in a battlefield as, and one side's running off. And that's essentially what's happened, right? We've we've mm -hmm. left everything over there, uh, couldn't get out of there fast enough. And uh, at least we've got one really great positive note. And that was the president said, we will not have a Saigon again with people hanging on the gear of a of a helicopter or a skid of a Huey. So. We turned that into a C-17 in a gear well, so I guess we're better off that way somehow. Well, technicalities. That's, <laughs> technicalities. Uh, that's technicalities. It's like, uh, you know, Biden saying the other day, uh, well, technically, or actually he didn't even use the word technically, that would have made it a little bit better, but saying, oh, no, that's a garbage report about the uh, amount right. of money we're going to be giving illegal immigrants. Like, yeah. no, and like literally 12 hours later, someone in the Biden administration, no, he's perfectly comfortable with that figure. I was like, oh, okay, well. Okay, yeah. yeah. If that's not proof that he's being handled, I don't know what is. But getting back to what we're uh, getting back to military issues, um, I wanted to get your take on this too, because frankly, I, I thought about just asking you off the air, but I think the audience would appreciate it too, because I just wanted to hear what you have to say on it. Uh, what about the whole thing with General Milley telling China he'd give him a heads up uh, if there was any kind of nuclear strike coming or something like that? So if I and and I and I was preface this by saying. I have no idea what was said, when it was said. I haven't read about it. I've, I've stayed out of that one. I haven't, I, I, you know, I'm just going to say okay. if that happened okay. and he was not told to be, uh, you, you know, uh, a, in some kind of diplomatic way mm -hmm. that he was doing that as some kind of strategy that the military set him up for, then, uh, you know, shame on him. Shame on him. You don't go and, and, and undermine. Uh, you know, your civilian leadership and, and put everybody else's lives at stake with some kind of assurance to somebody in a theater. Uh, first of all, first of all, anybody that's ever worked alongside a senior leadership when you're in the field like that or in your other places, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're not free to say whatever they want to say. They don't sit around and do, uh, you know, whatever, we just kind of make it up as they go. It is so structured. It is so disciplined. What can be said? What can't be said? What can be promised? What can't be promised? I mean, these things aren't just done willy nilly. And for them to be from senior leadership to the U.S. to China saying, hey, this is what we won't do or what we can't do uh, to say that nobody else knew about that. It's just it's beyond me to think that he's going to be able to try to defend that at all. If that happened, like I said, right, sure. if somebody's a big Millie supporter and they go, he never said that Lockwood, okay, fine, you know, great. You know, that it's a better point for him. If it did happen, though, there's not much he can stand on. But here, here's the, the worst part about this is there is nobody that's being accountable anymore in senior leadership. Think about that. There's just no accountability. These guys are getting away with, you got a coup on the president that happened. You got the FBI, the DOJ, everybody's running around doing whatever they want to do. And uh, I just haven't seen any accountability at all. You know, nobody's been brought up on any charges. There's been no investigation. Nobody's been arrested. And uh, and apparently, uh, you know, unless you're a conservative and make a phone call that, uh, you know, to the Ukraine, you know, then, then, then that's a big deal. And uh, so I just think it's, you know, we know what all this is about. This is a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an unjust kind of world. And those that uh, have power are taking more power and they're going to use it. And they've showed that they have no no self control whatsoever in it. So, well, and from the civilian side, history has shown if you want to make a civilian population angry enough to rebel, one of the key factors that you have to have is the belief that there is no accountability. If you believe, if you make them believe mm. that there is no recourse, that there is no way for them to vote themselves out of a situation or whatever, that's what makes people desperate. And the idea that you had a a person just unilaterally decide, you know. I will not going to listen to the civilians representative in the military. I'm just going to do whatever I want because I think it's what's actually best for the country. Well, you may believe that, but if that's the case, you need to resign and then go to the, the media and tell them 
you know, your concerns, you don't just subvert it and take it upon yourself to do that. And yeah. that, that's what, you know, that, that's what really concerned me on that one. Yeah. If you, if you look back at, uh, you know, say the Obama administration and look at general ham, uh, general McChrystal, you just, you think different individuals and why they were fired, why they stepped down, uh, why some senior leaders under say the Clinton regime, you know, they, they volunteered to step down because they disagreed with them. Uh, it's, there's a lot smaller infraction than what this would be that right. would cause an individual for the civilian leadership to say, we've lost confidence in your ability to lead. That's just a way of saying, look, you're not in my boat. We're not on the same page. I'm going to have to put you to the side. Thanks for your service. Uh, that That's happened all the time. Uh, but for- Well, and I'll say this, Scott, just, I don't mean to cut you off, but if Millie had come out and said, look, I, I think Trump's dangerous. I don't like his policies. I might have wound up disagreeing with him, but I would have respected his conviction for doing that. I really would have. Right. Right. And I think that's what you expect, right? I mean, you expect that well, when there's a point when you can no longer with a clear conscience serve the civilian leadership that you're under, that's what you do. You resign right. and people act like, well, no, they couldn't resign when, uh, for instance, uh, President Biden said, this is the way we're going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Well, what was the military going to do about it? Well, yeah, certainly if you kept, if you stayed in there punching away saying, hey, yeah, I'm his boy, uh, then you don't have anything to say about it. But the, but the past shows you what would have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have gone to him and said, look, with all due respect, sir, you know, that we disagree with it. This is why. Uh, and where are those days, by the way, where we have such integrity and leadership? You know, when Eisenhower was uh, cutting the budget after World War II and after the Korean War, you know, he was just, he was just decimating the military budget. And Arlie Burke, who was the chief of staff uh, at that time, the chairman mm -hmm. of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, he's talking all over saying, wow, this is going to this is going to put us in huge danger. Mm -hmm. This is going to put us in huge danger. This is not the time to, to save money. And Eisenhower was saying, no, I think this is the time. And uh, so Eisenhower calls him over to the White House. He says, Arlie, he said, and of course, they're both World War II fame. Right. But Arlie Burke right. was some commander of a PT boat or a, a destroyer, I believe. And uh, of course, Eisenhower was the uh, Allied Supreme Commander in uh, D-Day. But so, so he says, you know, I hear you're over there rabble rousing, you know, in, uh, in the Pentagon there. And he, he says, well, I, I disagree with you. And I think you're going to put America at, at grave danger. And so Eisenhower looks at him thinking, thinking how this is going to go. And he says, you know, we're both going to testify in front of Congress, in front of the budget hearings next week. He goes, if you say that and I say what I'm saying, he says, this is going to be a huge political fallout and it's going to be really messy. Mm -hmm. And Arlie Burke says something that's incredible. He looks at Eisenhower, his boss, the president of the United States, and he says, you know what, sir, you didn't hire me to be your political advisor. You hired me to give you the best military advice I can give you. And I think you're putting the United States at grave danger. And so <laughs> Eisenhower's got a choice now. Right. And so he's thinking about it and he contemplates this and for here's this great leader and shows incredible moral character. And he goes, you know, he goes, you know what, Arlie? He says, uh, I agree with you. And he says, uh, he says, you're right. And he goes, I tell you what, I'll go and I'll say what I have to say. And you go and you testify and you say what you have to say. And I'll deal with the political fallout. And the aftermath of this is after that, Eisenhower called Arlie Burke to the White House mm -hmm. many times and most of the time was not even discussing military affairs. He asked him about State Department. He asked him about the uh, interior. He asked him about uh, other things that were happening with the economics, the budget, taxation. And, and I always used to ask the commandant, you know, the uh, cadets, why do you think that happened? And why was he asking Arlie Burke about all these things? And it's because he found an individual that would shoot straight and tell him the truth and wasn't trying to cow to him, wasn't just a yes man. And so he respected that so much. And yet today uh, we saw the firings, like for instance, under President Obama, he was firing people right and left. If he didn't like your language, if he didn't like you, uh, the way you talked about a Muslim terrorist instead of an extremist, you were gone. You know, it's just all this, we can't have anybody around the president that disagrees with him. Um, and then on the other hand, you can see the detriment of what happens when you, uh, when you, when you don't get people that are lockstep and pro-American, like, uh, I think Trump kind of misunderstood and mis, you know, uh, really underestimated, uh, what was mm -hmm. going to happen there with individuals that were just out to get him and do everything they could. But, uh, I just, I love that story about Arlie Burke and Eisenhower about what that's like to be accountable, to be, has a moral character 
and to be able to say, you know what, you should be able to stand up and disagree, and then uh, we'll see what kind of leaders uh, you know you have. But in the end, of course, uh, if he told Arlie Burke uh, which way to salute, which way to march, he would have had to have done it. Or if he didn't agree, he would have had to step back. You, you know, know I, I think that's just a fantastic segue to ask you this, and, and this will be really kind of the, the question that we wrap on because I think it's a good stopping point. We have a tradition in the military that goes all the way back to George Washington about holding people accountable and expecting high moral character out of our soldiers. I mean, I know it's different today, but back in George Washington's day, he didn't allow any of his military personnel from officers to, to privates. They weren't allowed to use foul language. They weren't allowed to consume alcohol. And he required each and every one of them to attend a church service on Sunday. He's the one that started the chaplain program. And so I just wanted you to kind of talk about that. And uh, somebody who doesn't have as, as strong a connection to it as you do, um, what, what has happened to that, that sort of sense in the military that we're supposed to be people of a, of a high moral caliber serving this country? I think that's an excellent question. And I, and I failed to mention that when you asked me, what were the changes in the military that I saw uh, over my tenure? And one of them was, is uh, we had this incredible uh, loss of religious freedom, particularly just the, the Christian religion, what we would call Christian religion, mm -hmm. uh, as I was in, and things were changing very drastically. Uh, and that had to be addressed by Congress, which it shouldn't have had to have been. But a lot of people don't know this, but the Uniform Code of Military Justice gives the responsibility to the commander for the moral turpitude of the individuals under his command. And uh, some years back when we were at officer training school, uh, they had some mission statement that said, well, we were going to be culturally aware, we we're going to be expeditionary minded, uh, we we're going to be you know, professional, this, that, and the other. And I came in there on my first and second day, I started reviewing all the documents and I read that and I said, well, but what's the most important thing that we're doing here? I mean, I, this sounds like a political statement that, you know, what a politician would be happy with, but what is it that we're doing here in these, in these just few months and weeks that we have these cadets? And I kept saying that and, and people just didn't, they, were, they, they just had a hard time grasping it. And finally we sat down, we started tossing some stuff around and I said, this is what we're doing. We're making officers a moral character. And so I changed the mission statement to say, we are making leaders of moral character. And so then <laughs> as people started looking around, scratching their heads and going, what, what's wrong with this guy? Uh, we started had to define what is moral character? Why is that important? Why is it that we want leaders of moral character? And so I went through and I mean, I named names. I talked about uh, Admiral uh, Giardini from uh, Stratcom. He was the vice commander of Stratcom when I was there. Uh, there was no love lost between us, by the way, but, but <laughs> Admiral Giardini, he, after I left, which he, he, he was a really, really brilliant guy, a lot smarter than I was, but he, he basically didn't know why I was there. And after a while, I had a hard time answering it myself. And I thought, you know what? He's right. I don't know why I'm here. I might as well leave. So I did. But <laughs> shortly after that, Admiral Giardini got caught and he was uh, handing off counterfeit, or counterfeit poker chips across the river in a casino. And what was happening, he was gambling all night long, had counterfeit poker chips, and then was coming back to work at Stratcom. And he put our nuclear surety uh, in jeopardy. And he was a guy that was the vice commander of strategic command with all of these weapons at his disposal and his responsibility. And yet it was such a blackmailable type of fence that you think, well, you know, if the, if the wrong spies had gotten a hold of him at the right time, boy, that sure. guy would have been selling out like a, like a songbird. So... Uh, he ended up getting arrested, and I used examples like that, as hurtful as they may be to his family, but I used examples to the cadets to say, look, I'm telling you that you won't know all the answers, and we don't know what's coming around the corner, but if you're not an officer of moral character, you will never be able to na navigate all of these you know, difficult, confusing situations. And so we started down that road, making officers and leaders of moral character, defining what it is. And then this is what really, really hit us where we started getting in hot water was the Jags wanted to say, well, if they bust three tests, you can get them out. If they bust a PT test for the second time, you can kick them out. Uh, if they do this, if they lie, cheat or steal, and they do this, that or the other, you can kick them out. And I said, well, uh, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask each one of my instructors and I'm going to say, you're an officer in the United States Air Force. I'm going to trust your judgment and I'm going to support you. But the question I'm going to ask, is this person going to be a leader of moral character? And I said, if your answer is no, we're going to get rid of them. 
Well, the Jags and the lawyers just had a field there. They were just oh, like, oh, you know, they were just like, no, you can't do that. We can't, whoa, you're going to, you know, they were just starting. I'm like, you know what? First of all, thanks for your advice as a legal team. I'm a commander, you're not. And so I started, uh, started down that road. And sometimes mm -hmm. we were doing that. It didn't happen all the time, but we had a few individuals, uh, individuals that maybe were, uh, you know, on pornographic sites or something that everybody was like, well, you know what, talk to them, we counsel them, do this, that, the other. And I go, hey, you know what, as far as I'm concerned, this guy's on his best behavior for nine and a half weeks. This is the best he's ever going to be. Guess what he's going to be as an officer in the United States Air Force and a leader of people? He's going to be a problem. So we would kick him out and say he's not a leader of moral character. And uh, and so that that's kind of that, that. It's funny that you brought it up because it was a huge, huge push of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how long they probably put up with that after I left, but they probably changed it back to, well, you know, diplomatic language or something. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, just appreciate you and your service and your focus on um you know, having that high moral character, because I think it's the most important thing that anyone can can experience. And one of the things that I think has attracted people to the military and, and to military leadership for a long time is because of its character building uh, qualities. And I, I just think that now we almost think that you can have character without having a spiritual center uh, or oh, yeah. some something like that. And it just can't. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. No, absolutely not. What man thinks, uh, so is he. And, and we know that to be true, Caleb. And when you, you know, just like you could read a, a book about Nazi Germany and, and they'll talk about all different reasons why it happened or whatever. Um, but I'm and I am very fond of pointing out that those doctors that were operating experimentally and doing experiments and they were doing all that, they were Darwinist. And they were talking about the superior race. They were talking about who uh, hadn't uh, evolved, uh, who didn't deserve to live. They were talking about a supreme race. It was all Darwinism. And once you lose your mooring uh, and believing of the God of heaven and that he is the ultimate moral authority, mm -hmm. you can justify anything. And that's what history teaches us. You yes. can justify anything. Well, Scott, uh, I tell people that I would have been in the concentration camps and they say, well, you're not, you're not Jewish. You're not a gypsy. I was like, I know I'm white, but here's the thing that you may not know. There were several different labels inside the concentration camps. They had different colored triangles that they would say, and they had one that was purple. And that was for Bible scholars. I'm a master's student in Bible. I would have been in the concentration <laughs> camps. And what that tells you is Anybody that is well acquainted with God's word is a threat to tyranny. Absolutely. Because they answer to God and not to man. Absolutely, because they cannot be controlled that way. You're exactly right. All right. Well, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for coming down here. And uh, it is Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. I certainly appreciate it. I know my audience does too. Thank you, Caleb. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, brother. It's been, been a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe.